Well, good morning, Ebenezer family and friends. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for our online service. We're glad that you're with us. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Pastor Layton. I serve on the staff team here. And I, I'm very glad that you take the time each week to, to watch our service. And uh, we're, we're grateful for you and we think of you and we're praying for you often. Uh, this morning, uh, I hope that you're gonna be blessed as we hear more on the power of prayer. And as we enter into worship, realizing that even though you might be in your home uh, by yourself today or with your family, you're still worshiping with the Ebenezer family. And we're grateful for that. So, so let's just uh, pause and pray, and then I'll turn it over to Pastor Chet to lead us in a time of worship. So let's pray. So Father, again, we, we come to you today, and we come with expectation and hope. Our, our hope and expectation is that you the, the true and the living, powerful God would speak to us, that you would, that you would touch our hearts and that you would speak to our minds. And we, we might know that you are a God who is present with us and cares. And then as we, as we sing or as our minds and hearts uh, worship you, that you would accept this as an offering of our praise. And so guide us today and continue to unify us as the church. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now let's turn it over to Pastor Chet and join us as we worship together.
There's no wall you won't kick down, a lie you won't tear down, they're coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope who could could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. Chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the side. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. 
sin's grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope jesus christ my living hope oh you are my Well, hi again. Uh, standing beside me is Wes Hodgson, or re as we're going to call him, Pastor Wes. Wes started officially with our staff team this, this past week, and so we are super excited to have him. He's serving as pastor to the Young Adults Culture and Career Ministry, and he's going to do a wonderful job. I want to pray for him right away here, and he's going to pray for us. But before we do that, I just have a few other announcements to make. Uh, I want to invite you to our prayer time. It's, it's at 12 p.m. on Sunday following the morning service. And uh, we had a wonderful time of prayer last Sunday, and so I encourage you to join us for that. It's a Zoom prayer meeting. You can find the link on our website. And then this Sunday is our monthly worship and prayer night. And so that's at 6 p.m. on Sunday evening, also a Zoom uh, prayer time. So I encourage you to be part of that. Uh, many of you have, to have emailed the office regarding baptisms or child dedication, and we're going to have those as private um, viewings so that we can have the 30 people max and still have your family and friends here, then we'll show them later on. So if you're interested in being baptized or if you have a child you want dedicated, just contact the church office. And then I want to let you know that our annual charitable tax receipts are being sent to you via email this week and next week. So if you don't receive them by the end of the next week, just let us know. Anyway, let me just pray for, for Wes and uh, just ask that God would guide him in his ministry. So would you bow with me in prayer? So, Father in heaven, uh, thank you so much that you call uh, your children, uh, you call us and you gift your children to serve the church family. And so, thank you for the, for the giftings you've given Wes. Thank you for calling him to be part of our, our family here. And I pray that as, as this new chapter emerges and as he takes over the leadership of the college and career group, that you would just anoint him that you would use him, that you would bless him, that you would speak through him, that you would give him wisdom, that you would uh, give him power, that he would walk in your spirit listening to your voice. And Father, I pray that you would protect him and his family as they, as they serve in this capacity. And I pray that, that we as a church would, would come alongside and encourage Wes and his family just like um, we've, we've been an encouragement to the rest of the staff team. I pray that, that his... His beginning with the college and career would be well received, that he would be able to connect deeply and quickly with them. And so we just ask that your hand of power and blessing would be upon him as he, as he launches this new season of ministry in his life. And I commit him to you in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And I'm going to ask Wes if he would just lead uh, us, our church family, in a time of prayer. Awesome. Thanks, Leighton. Yeah, if you would join with me in, in prayer for our, our morning service. God, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your mercy and your faithfulness in our lives. And God, we thank you that even though we are distanced right now and unable to gather physically, that we still have the opportunity to gather together in this way. And we thank you for that, Lord. And God, we pray right now that as we enter into this service and tune our hearts to you, Father, we ask that you would be speaking to us. We ask that you would minister to our hearts and minds, that you would encourage and strengthen us and, and challenge us where we need to be challenged. And God, in particular, I want to pray for those who are feeling isolated, who are feeling alone right now. God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would come alongside of them and encourage them and strengthen them right now. And that we as a church family, that you would put names and faces on our minds and hearts of people who we can reach out to in this time and show your love and show your grace to. So God, we commit this service to you. We ask you to be honored and glorified and that we as your people would be built up in your spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For the last number of weeks, our sermon series has focused on prayer. We've looked at the importance of prayer, the Lord's pattern for prayer, why it's important to persist in prayer, and last week, 
We looked at the good gifts the Father gives us when we pray. Our speaking team has covered a lot of major topics relating to prayer, and our hope, and our prayer, is that you're feeling more equipped to pray as a result. Having said that, my sense is that there are probably still some of us that are, are lacking the confidence to pray. Perhaps you're new in faith to Christ, or, or perhaps the concept of prayer seems foreign to you. Perhaps prayer hasn't been modeled in your home. A lot of things can make us feel uncomfortable when it comes to prayer. That's one end of the spectrum, feeling inadequate. Then on the other end of the spectrum, there are probably a number of us who have been followers of Jesus for some time, but if we've not yet become the prayer intercessors that we could be. We pray, but there's still a desire within us to pray more, to be more deeply committed to prayer, to grow as an intercessor. Today we'll begin by looking at a story from Scripture that I believe can help both the confidence of those who feel inadequate, as well as those, as well as those rather, who want to become more effective prayer intercessors. Now this story is a little bit unique. The initial account is found in the Old Testament, but then in the New Testament we're actually given more information that helps us understand the Old Testament story better. In 1 Kings 16 and following, we find the story of Elijah. Elijah was a prophet of God who lived during the time of Ahab, perhaps the most ungodly king in Israel's entire history. And here, here's parts of the story to just set the stage. 1 Kings 16, starting at 29. Ahab became king of Israel. Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He also married Jezebel and began to serve Baal and worship him. Ahab did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. Now Ahab, obviously, was a very ungodly king. Now his marriage to Jezebel was also important. She was the daughter of a neighboring king, a kingdom that wasn't too far away, the, the king of Sidonia. Now she also brought with her her worship of Baal into Israel, which Ahab embraced personally, and then he even promoted in the nation. Now, Elijah the prophet, he had to challenge the sinfulness of Ahab, 1 Kings 17. Now, Elijah the Tishbite said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now, this is actually a key concept. Baal was considered the god of fertility, but he was also called by another name. And it's interesting. The name is the Lord of the rain and the dew. So when Elijah told Ahab there would be no rain or dew, this was a direct challenge to the authority and the power of Baal himself. 1 Kings 18, when we pick the story up again. After a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go, eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off uh, to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the, the sky grew black with clouds, the wind rose and, and a heavy rain started falling and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. Now, we want to take a moment now and go to the New Testament, where we actually find another passage, quite a short passage, that actually helps us understand what happened in the Old Testament a little bit better. James chapter 5, verse 17. Picture of Elijah. Elijah was a human being, even as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Then in 18, again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. So the first thing that I want us to notice today is that Elijah was a human being, even as we are. Now, I'm not sure what you think when you hear the name Elijah, but I think of this incredible prophet from the Old Testament. He stood alone against King Ahab. He took on 450 prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. On Mount Carmel. He turned the whole nation of Israel back toward God. In some ways, it seems that he was superhuman. But here, James points out that Elijah was a human being, just like us. Now, the word James uses actually emphasizes common humanity. This means that Elijah and you and I, we have the same nature. We're all naturally sinful because of Adam's original sin. So Elijah wasn't superhuman. In fact, if we read 1 Kings further, we see that Elijah was fearful, that he got discouraged at times, that he became depressed. At, at the core, Elijah and, and us were made from the same stuff. 
Elijah wasn't Superman. Neither was Abraham or David or the Apostle Paul. We're all cut from the same cloth. And so what this reveals to us is that the power of prayer wasn't in, the, in Elijah, but in his powerful God. It wasn't about Elijah, it was, it was about God and what he wanted to accomplish. Now this is great news for those of us wanting to understand prayer better. This means that you don't have to be superhuman to pray and make an impact. And that's the first point that I want to want to draw us to today. This means that everyone can pray effectively. Everyone can pray effectively because it's not about us. It's about the power of God. So if you're a new believer, you can pray and you can make a difference. It's not about you. It's about God. If you've been a follower of Jesus a long time, you can pray effectively because prayer is about the power of God. It's not about us. Next thing that, that kind of stuck out to me as I looked at the passage was how Elijah prayed. In James we read, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. Now literally this means with prayer he prayed or with prayer he did pray. Now the context of the James passage is that James is trying to encourage everyday believers like you and I to pray. So I don't see why James would first normalize Elijah by pointing out that his nature is the same as ours and then set him apart by focusing on Elijah's fervent prayer. This seems inconsistent. But now we look at 1 Kings to help us interpret the James passage. We see Elijah's posture. That's the first thing that I, I thought of. He climbed to the top of the mountain. He, put, he bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Now, I'm not convinced that his posture was any different than any other praying person of this era. A lot of people were very spiritual at this time, were very religious. This is how they would have prayed. So I don't think it was about his posture. But, was, but what was different was his persistence. 1 Kings 18, we read it earlier. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. No sign of rain. Seven times Elijah said, go back. Then finally, the seventh time, the servants reported, a cloud as small as a man ha man's hand is rising from the sea. Now, some writers suggest that seven is the perfect number, and they're going to check for signs of rain seven times denotes completion of the miracle. Now, that's an interesting thought. But what I find more compelling is that this focuses on Elijah praying persistently. He prayed once, sent the servant, no cloud. Again, sent the servant, still no cloud. He prayed a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time, still no cloud. Each time, Elijah went back to prayer, despite no sign of rain. And then on the seventh time, the servant saw a small, a small rain cloud forming. Now that's persistent prayer. In Luke 18, Jesus tells his disciples the parable of a widow who kept coming before an ungodly judge until he granted her justice. And he told this parable, and we read this in Luke 18.1, to show them that they should always pray and not give up. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Paul tells us to pray continually. See, what I believe James captures by describing Elijah as praying earnestly, and some translations even say fervently, is the inner attitude of Elijah. He understood that as a human, he had zero ability to influence the weather. And so he threw himself into the only thing that he could do, the thing that God asked him to do, and that was to pray and rely on the power of God. He prayed with prayer persistently that God would do as he said he would until God told him that he would do otherwise. Now this understanding of the way in which Elijah prayed aligns better with the larger picture of Scripture. And I believe it can actually encourage those of us who are just learning to pray, as well as those of us who feel the need to pray more. So the second point that I want, I want to mention is this. Effective prayer is about the right heart, not the right words. Effective prayer is about the right heart, not the right words. It's not about being more passionate or pounding the pulpit or, or doing all sorts of crazy things that some of us do as a means of getting God's attention. It's about the inner recognition that God alone will do the work. And persistence in prayer, that's evidence of this belief. Persistence in prayer is evidence of a posture of humility as well, of recognition that it's up to God and no one else or nothing else. To put it simply, the fact of prayer, it's about the right heart. So the example of Elijah shows us a couple things. First of all, that everyone can pray effectively because it's about the power of God. It's not about us. 
And it shows us as well that effective prayer is about the right heart, not the right words. Now, there's a second passage that I want to dig into a little bit today that I believe can also boost our desire to pray and our ability to pray. And it's, it's, it's actually a bit of a complicated passage. It, it opens up a lot of different things. And we're going to look at it as, as best we can here today. In, uh, we find it in 1 John chapter 5, 13 through 15. And I'll, I'll read that. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that if he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Now here's the the first question that I see coming out of this passage. Why can I have confidence when I approach God in prayer? Quick story. When I was in college, I played volleyball on our college team. We actually had a pretty good team. The core of our squad was together for about three years. And the last year, we toured Western Canada. We went from Manitoba right to the BC coast and back. And we beat schools that were literally 10 times our size. And I clearly remember one particular game. I had a bit of an injury. (laughs) I came down off a block awkwardly and I jammed my big toe (laughs) very badly. And so we called a timeout and I hobbled over to the bench and we took off my shoe and my sock and my big toe was literally off to the side of my foot. It had popped out of place. I mean, there was literally a gap of three quarters of an inch between my toe and the one next to it. So so what do you do with that, right? Well, I was sitting on the bench and our coach had my foot in his hand, in his hands, and he's kind of feeling this, just kind of checking things out. And next thing I know, he grabs my toe and he gives this huge yank. And I'm yelling a little bit, but what he had done is he had popped it back in place. And I had to sit the rest of the match, I think. Maybe I went out for one short shift, I'm not sure. But I, I did have to rest after the game, but I was literally playing within a couple of days rest. Now, if I'd been in the, co- the crowd watching from the bleachers and had stumbled on the stairs and put my toe out, coach probably wouldn't have pay- paid any attention at all. But because I was on the team, he listened to my issue, he took care of my need. So why can we have confidence when approaching God in prayer? We can have confidence because we're on his team. Verse 14 says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. And the context for 14 is actually found in the verse prior, in 13, that you may know that you have eternal life. That's the context, eternal life. And so here's the point that I want to make from this. We can have confidence in prayer because the foundation for prayer is in the salvation we have through Jesus. When we accept Christ, we become a member of God's team and we're given access to God through prayer. We come with confidence not because of what we've done, but because of what Christ has done. Our confidence is in Jesus, whose blood makes us a part of the team, to carry the analogy, or the family of God, as Scripture says. And this gives us access to the very throne of God. The word confidence actually has a really interesting nuance. To come with confidence or to come with boldness, as some translations say, means to come with the freedom to say it all, to lay it all out there. It's about having an attitude of openness that stems from from having no fear. And that allows us to say everything that we feel needs to be said. One writer said, it's a free and fearless confidence, a cheerful and courageous confidence, a bold and assured confidence. Hebrews affirms the work of Christ, calling him our great high priest. And then we read in chapter 4, verse 16, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This freedom, this ability to just lay it out there before God without any fear whatsoever, with confidence, is only given to those who are of the family of God. And so when we put our faith in Christ and join the team, become part of the family, We can come with confidence, knowing that he'll hear us and give attention to us. Now we find another reason in this passage for the confidence uh, we can have when we pray. And it's found in the latter part of verse 14. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God. We mentioned that already, that if we ask anything. When I worked in our family business, I was on the road a lot. Restaurant food was pretty much the norm five days a week. Have you ever noticed that everything in the restaurant, unless you ask special, but everything comes with french fries? Burger and fries, cutlet and fries, ribs and fries, steak sandwich and fries. After a big job, after a big move, we always had steak. 
fries came with it. Now, I learned to have fries with pretty much every meal, but for me, I had to have ketchup. I had to have ketchup with it. Now, sometimes the servers would bring our meals and forget the ketchup. And then they'd go on and wait on other, com other customers. <laughs> no ketchup. But see, if I caught their attention and asked, they would gladly bring the Heinz or whatever, and I could go on and enjoy my meal. 1 John 5.14 says, if we ask anything, See, God wants us to ask. In fact, He loves it when we ask. See, asking and for is that we're in a position of dependency. If we can do something on our own, we don't ask because there's no need to ask. But asking our Heavenly Father through prayer reveals our dependency upon Him. Asking also requires humility. There are some of us that find it really hard to ask for help. We think we can fix the problem or the issue on our own. Not asking, I think, in all honesty, reveals our pride. But asking God shows our dependency upon Him. Asking shows our humility. Asking pleases God. And so we need to be asking. We can be confident. He wants us to ask. James 4, uh, verse 2 says, You don't have because you do not ask God. So God is our Heavenly Father who gives us good gifts, like Leighton spoke about last week. He did a great job of that. God gives us good gifts, and He wants us to ask. And that's the next point I want to make this morning. We can have confidence in prayer because God tells us to ask. And we need to ask with the right motivation and the right attitude. When our teenagers ask to use the car to go in an event that's good for them, that's encouraging, that builds them up, parents typically open up and, and are, they're even pleased to let them use the car. But if we know that our kids are going to be uh, going to something that might be harmful or detrimental, good parents will say no. See, motivation is important. James 4 verse 3 says, When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. God wants us to ask, and He wants us to ask with the right motivation. Now, this whole line of thinking, this train of thought, leads us to the next aspect of prayer. And we find this in the latter part of verse 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything, and then here's the next part, part that I want to look at here. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Asking in alignment with the will of God, that is a big theme in Scripture. In the Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer that we looked at a couple of weeks back, it says, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's about God's will. When Jesus was praying in the garden just prior to the crucifixion, he prayed, My Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. See, biblical prayer is directly connected to the will of God. Biblical prayer is not trying to talk God into giving us what we want. It's submitting our will to His will. And that's the next point I want to make this morning. We can have confidence in prayer when we ask according to His will. This is a, a biblical truth when it comes to prayer. And it actually leads us to another question this morning. That's a big one. And that's how can we know the will of God? There's probably several of us have been, who have asked that very same question. This summer, Sand and I will be married 35 years. It's been awesome. It's gone so quickly. And we're at the point in life where we don't have really any obvious needs, not like when we were first married. So when it comes to Christmas gifts and birthday gifts and that sort of thing, we actually talk about it before we even purchase the gift. And so it's not a huge surprise when the paper comes off. Now, for some of you, it might seem a bit strange, but that's just kind of where we're at. But our gifts to one another come out of the conversations that we have with each other. It comes out of the relationship that we have with one another. And that's what I want to point out. Understanding the will of God comes out of our relationship with God. What, what to ask for, what our needs are, how to lay them before Him, it comes about, out of our relationship with Him. It comes from intentionally spending time with God, where we invite the Spirit of God to shape us and change our hearts. The shaping work of the Spirit, which comes as we relate to God, helps us understand the will of God. John 15, 4 says, Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now, to remain is to be in proper fellowship with God. It's to be in right relationship with Him. 
Now here's another key verse when it, when it comes to understanding the will of God. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now one of the primary ways which we can renew the mind and therefore understand the will of God is to be immersed in the Word of God. And that's the next sub-point. We can understand the will of God out of relationship with Him, and we can understand the will of God from knowing the Word of God. So when we're in the Word, our thinking changes. Our attitudes adjust. Our desires are shifted when we're in the Word of God. Paul uses the word transformed, and that is actually what happens when we're in the Word of God, allowing the Spirit of God to do the work of God within us. Back in John 15, we actually see this correlation between being in the Word, remaining, and asking and receiving. John 15, 7, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. A couple of closing thoughts. When we read passages like we looked at today and we understand the concepts, it's easy to feel that every time we pray, God should answer. And I guess if we understood these things perfectly and we were walking in relationship and fellowship with God perfectly and we had the right amount of faith, you know, that, that could well be the case. But for me, here's the truth. I prayed for the salvation of people and not everyone has come to Christ. Some, yeah, but not everyone by any stretch. I prayed for restored relationships, broken relationships, uh, to be restored, and they've not. They've not been. I prayed for healing. It's not always happened. Personally, my prayer batting average isn't anywhere near 1,000, nor 500, or maybe even 200. My sense is, I'm probably not alone in this. But here's the thing. See, God encourages us to pray. In fact, we're told to pray. We're commanded to pray in Scripture. Prayer is a part of being a follower of Jesus. So to not pray would be a pretty serious sin of omission, I think. So today, I'd like us to commit to continue to step up to the plate and pray. Let's continue to swing away. And when we see God answer, let's remember to thank Him, as Philippians 4, 6 says. And let's also take the time to share what God has done with one another. Hearing what God has done can be a huge encouragement for us as a family of God. Now here's my final closing thought. I want to go back to where we started with Elijah. Elijah was in fellowship with God. He listened to the Lord. He understood God's will. And he prayed. And the prayers of Elijah challenged the false gods of the time and helped to change the course of the nation. See, everyone can pray effectively because it's about the power of God. It's not about us. It's about the right heart, not the right words. And we can have the confidence to go to God in prayer because the foundation for that is in the salvation that we have through Jesus. We can pray because God asks us to. And we can have confidence in prayer when we ask according to His will. And here's the last point that I want to make, and that's this. See, we can pray and make a difference. We can pray and make a difference. We can intercede on behalf of others, on behalf of the church, on behalf of our nation. We can, we can pray and we can make a difference. And so if you're new to prayer, or if you're a seasoned veteran, let's pray. We can all pray. We can all make a difference. Sermon questions for this morning, if, if you'd like to take them and just kind of discuss them as a family or as a group, you can find them uh, by texting sermon to 306-249-0084. And I would just like to invite you to, to engage in prayer, very practically, to join us in prayer. Um, following uh, the service today, and I believe this evening as well, and you'll find the link to those prayer events to be invited to those times on our website or on our digital bulletin or in, in our weekly email. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this time. Thank you for your word and the encouragement that we find in it to pray. And I ask, I pray that you would help us to become uh, more prayerful people, people who are more reliant upon prayer um, continually, that we might pray without ceasing, as Scripture says, um, and that you might grow that desire and that ability within us as we open ourselves to you. We ask this in your name. Amen. We 
are called to be a people of prayer, of fervent petition, compassion, and care. And we arise to meet this call to share the light of your glory your mighty deliverance the power of your passion for people As we bring our, our morning uh, today to a close, I think it's only fitting that we focus again on one of the most impactful prayers ever mentioned in Scripture. The night before Jesus was crucified, he prayed, My Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. See, through prayer, Jesus was able to express his heart to the Father, recognizing the agony that awaited him, yet also submitting himself to the Father's greater plan. Jesus' obedience to his Father's will actually paid the sin debt owed by every one of us and opened the way for us to be in right relationship with the Heavenly Father. The work of Christ is absolutely central to our faith and we're commanded by Christ himself to remember what he did on our behalf. In 1 Corinthians we read, The Lord Jesus, on the night before, on the night he was betrayed rather, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
I just invite you to, uh, to take now the bread that you've prepared even at your home and let's share this together. Jesus continued, In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And so I just invite you to, uh, to join with me and, and take the cup that you prepared, even in, in your own setting, and let's share this together uh, in remembrance of the blood of Christ that was poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Father, I want to thank you this morning that we can recall what it is that Jesus has done on our behalf, how he willingly went to the cross and gave himself in bodily form. I thank you for his body that was broken on our behalf. I thank you for his blood that was poured out on our behalf for the forgiveness of sin. And we thank you today that we have the amazing privilege, first of all, of remembering what was done, but of course, as well, remembering that it was this act of incredible love that brought us into the relationship that we can have with you as Father. And so today we, we thank you for this. We thank you that we can remember and we thank you that we can know you because of what Jesus has done. We give praise for this now in that name, uh, that life-changing, life-giving name of Jesus. Amen. Romans says, just in closing, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Thanks for being with us today.